Amid the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, tens of thousands of Afghans who worked alongside the U.S. military made desperate attempts to flee. It's really scary because brutal Taliban, they're never forgiven. For those able to leave, the difficult journey to permanent resettlement was just beginning. We will stand with you just as you stood with us. But the process is so complicated. A year after the U.S. departure from Afghanistan, we follow the journey of several former translators for the U.S. military and those trying to help them. I'm hoping I can track him down and, and maybe serve as a sponsor for him back here if, if he's able to come to the United States. Why? I loved him. I mean, he saved our lives or at least prevented some really bad things from happening uh, on that and, and on some other occasions as well. The Flight of the Translators, now on the Inside Story. Thanks for joining us. I'm Voice of America's Midwest correspondent, Kane Fairbaugh. During the war in Afghanistan, roughly 50,000 Afghan interpreters served alongside U.S. military forces. About 300 of them died in Afghanistan since 2001 while waiting for immigrant visas. As the Taliban closed in on securing the country amid the U.S. withdrawal, about 20,000 interpreters and family members were still attempting to reach the United States. Now, a year after the last U.S. troops left Afghanistan, we explore the difficult journey of several interpreters Voice of America had exclusive access to during and after the U.S. military left the country. We begin 20 years ago, during my first visit to Afghanistan, at the start of what would become America's longest war. The U.S. military had been in Afghanistan just a few months when I landed at Bagram Airfield in May of 2002 on a reporting assignment for the American Forces Network. Major Brian Cole with the United States Army Reserve and the 489th Civil Affairs Battalion. I first met Charles Brian Cole on a windswept mountain slope in rural Afghanistan, working with his Afghan interpreter, Haya Det, to deliver school supplies and food to local villagers as part of the U.S. Army's effort to win the hearts and minds of Afghans. Cole's mission this day was distributing supplies at a recently reopened school shut down by the Taliban prior to the U.S. invasion. Look in the land of the giants sometimes. In the remote village of Karabagh Bazaar, which we were told had just been cleared of landmines. When we write letters home, we tell them that the people of Afghanistan need school supplies. I look at what we're doing as an extension of our, of our foreign policy of having the people come back from Pakistan and Iran back into Afghanistan. And if we're going to have the people come back, then we need to assist them once, once they get here to help them get established. You got the message of Working with translators like Hayadet was key to Cole's efforts. Later that same day, the duo delivered food to another remote village, all part of the U.S. military strategy to win the hearts and minds of the Afghan people. And what we're doing by bringing the school supplies and the food now is we're serving as a stopgap until the non-governmental organizations can get here until they can start taking over our mission. Thank you. You're welcome. Nearly 20 years since we met in Afghanistan, after some effort tracking him down, how y'all doing? I learned Cole Great. safely returned home. We reconnected last summer at Fort Boonesboro outside Lexington, Kentucky. I'm a state park ranger now, and I have like a phobia against trash because that's one thing they were doing. They would take MRE boxes and put explosives in it, or just roadside trash would all, all of a sudden become a mine. Despite the risk, Cole felt his unit's objectives were clear. Our mission was to help uh, two things, to gain support for us being there and to put in water wells and things like that and to help gain acceptance with the U.S. forces being there. And then also the bigger picture was to help gain support for the newly established Afghan government. Cole believes the big picture lost focus when the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003. You can only have one main effort and we tried to have two main efforts and I think we took our, uh, our eye off the ball when we did that. The war in Afghanistan took a personal toll on Cole. Show me 97 to the boat ramp. His daughter was just a month old when he deployed, and his absence was difficult for his family back in Kentucky. My wife, she never accepted me going, and we never recovered from that, and I ended up, uh, I ended up divorced. Cole says he made sacrifices to build a better Afghanistan, 
but that mission was never accomplished. I think a better way to say it is the mission's over. Cole says the legacy of the U.S. military in Afghanistan is best measured by what didn't happen. We were able to keep similar 9-11 attacks from occurring, and I think they would have had we not gone. You know, the training camps would have, would have flourished even more so. Which is why he feels the U.S. military should have stayed in Afghanistan, pointing to forces stationed in countries like Germany and Japan since World War II as a precedent. If you leave too soon, you're back too early. Cole has since retired from the U.S. Army. When we spent time together last summer, he shared he had few regrets about his service in Afghanistan, but he was worried about the fate of his Afghan interpreter, Hayadet. I'm hoping I can track him down and, and maybe serve as a sponsor for him back here if, if he's able to come to the United States. Why? I loved him. I mean, he kept us safe. Cole credits his interpreter with saving the lives of his fellow soldiers and his own. What will you do if you can get him here? Uh, uh, give him a place to live. How do you think he would appreciate that? Oh, he'd love it. We talked about that. We talked about him coming to the United States. As I left my meeting with Cole, I decided I would try to help him locate high debt. The task was daunting. Without a recent known location, or even his full name and birthday, there was not a high level of confidence we would be able to locate him. I spent several weeks communicating with staff at VOA's Afghan language services using the minimal amount of information I had to see if they could help locate Hayadet in Afghanistan. We were unsuccessful and the effort ended when much of VOA staff left Afghanistan as the Taliban regained control. Interpreters like Hayadet were invaluable to American forces. As the U.S. military withdrew, many of those Afghans left behind feared for their lives. VOA's Carolyn Prasuti spoke to several interpreters engaged in a dangerous effort to survive until they could flee. Najib could be here, or he could be here, or here. He moves from city to city for safety from the Taliban. For 11 years, he worked as an interpreter for U.S. Special Forces, braving firefights across Afghanistan. In local province, and Kabul, a lot of these places, Nuristan, Kuna, Ningrahar province. Najib has awards for his shrapnel wounds and for saving the lives of two army captains. They saved me, I saved them, because we are teammates. In 2010, because of his job with the Americans, the Taliban kidnapped Najib's nine-year-old son and asked for ransom. They know I'm working with the American forces and uh, they are infidel and you are also infidel because you are working with them and you providing all kind of uh, help to them. The Afghan police rescued his son a few weeks later in a gun battle with his kidnappers. He says they killed an older son a few months ago. Now Najib is trying to save his own life after cell phone threats from the Taliban. They tell me uh, they know my place, where I'm staying, and they, they were coming, uh, coming after me. Najib applied for a special immigrant visa, an SIV, more than three years ago. The embassy told him processing is delayed. President Biden said this about interpreters like Najib. There is a home for you in the United States, if you so choose, and we will stand with you just as you stood with us. But the process is so complicated. Ismail Khan came to the United States on an SIV seven years ago. He was an interpreter alongside Najib, whom he nicknamed GPS. He knew where to go, where, uh, what uh, route to take, what would be the easiest, where are possible places for them to ambush us to, to make sure that they are alert. He tried everything to make sure that his team survive and be successful. But Khan worries for his colleague. They are after him. He, he's going to get killed if, if he doesn't get out. At the time of the U.S. withdrawal, the Biden administration had approved 2,500 special visas for Afghans who assisted the military. 1,000, like Khan, settled in the U.S. But as many as 25,000 still remain, including an interpreter we will call James. And they're about to take over. James has been denied the special visa because he cannot provide paperwork proof of his employment. It's really scary. 
It's really scary because brutal Taliban's, they're never forgive us. James told VOA that fears for his safety and that of his family kept him awake at night. And like Najib, he feared for what would happen after the complete withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Around the same time last year, U.S. Army Brigadier General Michael Greer watched the news at Kabul's airport amid the U.S. withdrawal. He was concerned about the fate of the Afghan translator who worked with him during a 2004 to 2005 deployment named Hidayat. We clicked almost immediately. He was a couple of years older than the other interpreters. He made a great first impression. Part of our mission was to go out and speak with uh, village elders and government officials. And we might be gone for seven, nine days at a time. Um, Hadiat was, was always the one that I chose to go on those missions. He had a real keen sense of situational awareness. I would say similar to street smarts, but in Afghanistan. Greer recalled one moment in particular when he believes Hidayat's street smarts saved their lives. We were meeting with some village elders in a kind of an open air market, and there had been some Taliban activity in that area recently. And uh, during the meeting, Hidayat grabbed me by the arm and said, we must go now. Greer says Hidayat overheard conversations relaying their position to others outside the area and feared the worst. He saved our lives or at least prevented some really bad things from happening uh, on that and, and on some other occasions as well. Even though Greer spent almost every day of his deployment with Hidayat, after he departed Afghanistan in 2005, they lost touch. Internet access at that time in Afghanistan wasn't reliable, and Greer had difficulty tracking him down. But a connection with another former Afghan translator on social media, who Greer helped resettle in the United States, surprisingly had Hidayat's contact information and shared it with Greer in 2020. So I, I reached out to Hidayat five minutes after I, I got that contact information. Uh, he told me he was in Kabul, that, that he was trying to get a visa. As the situation in Afghanistan deteriorated amid the withdrawal of U.S. forces, Greer's concern for Hidayat's safety grew. And one evening I saw a news report that the Taliban were going to stop allowing people to come to the airport. And so I texted Hidayat and I told him to go to the airport immediately to take the letters that he had and to, to find an American and, and show that those letters to an American. Uh, he didn't respond to that text. That's because Hidayat, whose full name is Hidayatullah Hisari, and his family of six were desperately trying to enter the Kabul airport, which was guarded by U.S. Marines. I asked the, one of the U.S. soldiers, I told him, you need help. He asked me, can you speak English? I told him, I'm interpreter. I used to work for the nine years with the U.S. Army. Amid the crush of thousands of Afghans trying to flee the country, the Marines accepted Hisari's help. I did the interpretation for five hours. Finally, I asked one of the captain. I told him I am also used to work with the U.S. Army. Please help me. As Hisari stood in a ditch among the throng for nearly six hours translating, his own pleas were no different than most trying to enter the airport at that time. But the former Afghan translator had connections. I think you have to put it in perspective that six hours he was standing in the ditch. It wasn't a ditch, it was a sewage canal. Just inches away from safety, Hisari made a final desperate phone call to Greer. I woke up to the phone ringing and the caller ID was an Afghan number. I could hear crowd noise, I could hear background static, and then the call dropped. Almost immediately, the phone rang again and, and it was Hadai. He said, I'm at the gate. Hassari gave the phone to a nearby U.S. Marine. I identified myself and, and told the Marine that, that Hadiat had a letter from me uh, and that he was who he said he was. Uh, the Marines said, I, I, got, I got it, uh, and then the call ended. It took two more days before Hassari texted Greer to confirm they were safely inside the airport. Hisari and his family were among an estimated 116,000 Afghans attempting to flee the country as the Taliban gained control. Another was Najib, one of the interpreters profiled by VOA's Carolyn Prasuti. Taliban. When VOA first spoke to Najib last July, he was targeted for death by the Taliban because he was an interpreter for U.S. Special Forces. We did not reveal his face or real name. They tell me uh, they know my place, where I'm staying, and they, they were coming, uh, coming after me. 
Outside the Kabul airport, Najib's toddler was knocked unconscious in the chaos as they tried to escape. The family of seven was left behind as the final American planes left Afghanistan, so they returned to their home in Jalalabad. And that time I was completely hopeless. Without the government's help, Najib's former officers stepped in with personal money, as did the nonprofit No One Left Behind. But as a wanted man, Najib had to find a way to get his family past 12 checkpoints to return to the capital. They are looking for me, they're not, they doesn't know my family. So I get from cover and go around the checkpoints, like a 30 minute, uh, 30 minute, 45 minutes walk around. The family flew out of Afghanistan and waited in Pakistan for their special immigrant visas. <laughs> then last month, finally touching down on U.S. soil, they were greeted by Americans and American money. It's looked like a big dream, but when I get to the state and I see my friends here and other guys, now I believe I made it. Najib, an electrical engineer by trade, has found work at a friend's house. He plans to return to school for a certification. He's not the only one headed to school. Her name is Sahar. She's three, year, three and a half years old. Next name is Abu Bakr. He's six years old. And my other son. His five children have old. missed a few years of school because of COVID, then because of the Taliban's restrictions on girls. But here. So they can do anything they want, anywhere they want to go. So they have to be free forever. Najibullah can't believe what he sees in the Seattle air. His first snow. He calls home to tell his children to look outside. It's one of many firsts for a man who thought he'd be dead by now. And Najib is now free to go anywhere too even as he looks over his shoulder. It's another first, his first drive with a U.S. license, steering his life freely without death threats. Once Adayatollah Hisari and his family were safely inside the Kabul airport, it was just the beginning of a very long journey that would send them around the world. Over the next several months, the Hisari family flew to Germany with only the clothes on their backs and the small amount of personal items they could bring. They processed through Ramstein Air Base and finally reached the United States at a temporary resettlement site at Fort Dix, New Jersey, where they waited as Hisari's application for a special immigrant visa, or SIV, wound its way through the U.S. State Department, only to be rejected. That's when attorney John Bellinger picked up their case. I've been working on Afghan issues for more than 20 years. When the U.S. decided to leave uh, Afghanistan last year, resulting in the flood of refugees, uh, uh, I was very anxious to help out. Bellinger became aware of Hisari's visa issues through contact with Army Brigadier General Michael Greer. Our firm has a very active pro bono practice, and in this case, there were many Afghans who were in need. So I said I would be happy to try to help uh, Mr. Hassari to appeal the uh, initial denial of his visa because he had not provided enough background information about his time as an interpreter in Afghanistan. Bellinger explained the reason for denying Hassari's visa was the lack of proof he actually worked as an interpreter for the U.S. military. And of course, it's very difficult to collect all of the records, to contact witnesses, but that's the sort of thing that we as lawyers are able to help with. While Greer had maintained contact with Hisari, retired U.S. Army Major Charles Brian Cole was in Kentucky, still unable to trace his long-lost Afghan interpreter, Hayadet. After I saw the collapse of the Afghan government and, and the, the takeover by the Taliban, I really worried about him and his family because, you know, we were high profile and I'm sure he worked for other, uh, in other capacities, a high profile position and, and, you know, his work with us probably wasn't viewed favorably with the Taliban. Then in December, Cole received a phone call thanks to a small but important gesture in the last moments they were together in Afghanistan almost two decades earlier. When I left how you did, I gave him a letter of introduction and he had produced that letter to show that he had worked with us. So this immigration attorney from Washington, D.C. contacted me. That attorney was working with Bellinger and his firm to make contact with a number of potential contacts who could help with Greer's interpreter, 
Hisari's case. My associates worked extremely hard to try to find these uh, names. That's when it became clear that the man Cole affectionately referred to as Hyadet, which Greer knew as Hedayat, was actually the same person, Hedayatullah Hisari, who worked for both officers at different times in Afghanistan. Cole explained to the attorneys trying to help Hisari, not only could he personally vouch for him and the work he did for the U.S. military, he had video proof. Hisari and Cole are seen working together in this original footage I gathered in 2002 during my first coverage assignment to Afghanistan for the American Forces Network. There he was, working with me, and if, if you'll see footage, I mean, uh, we were covering quite a bit of civil affairs. He's literally my right-hand man. Justice says about the, your school. The footage of that video showed him actually in the classroom, serving as an interpreter with me, and also with passing out uh, relief supplies that we couldn't have done without, without him. Certainly if there were videos uh, that were done at the time, uh, perhaps that could be helpful as well. This is, this is certainly a well-documented story. Bellinger says the outpouring of support by those Hisari worked with is boosting their efforts to finally secure his special immigrant visa. When we reached out to all of the people who he had helped, they all jumped to try to help him to say, uh, what can I provide, and wrote really very moving letters on his behalf. This is the letter from... 6 November 2002. While Hisari's application continues to wind its way through the appeal process, he and his family have settled near relatives in Clearwater, Florida. I never thought it would be this long or under these circumstances, but I think it's great. I think it's great what we've done to get him settled here. How do you feel right now? I feel great. I feel uh, kind of anxious to see him and see how things are going, but it, it, it feels like it's coming full circle from when I first met him there in Bagram Airfield. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I'm in your parking lot. I'm trying to figure out which is your building. Yeah, yeah, I'm behind you. Oh, man. After being separated for nearly 20 hey. years and after months of agonizing uncertainty, Cole made the 11 hour drive from Kentucky to Florida for a long overdue reunion. Man, nice it's great you. to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, great yeah. to see you. I'm glad yeah. you're here. Man, Thanks a lot. boy, it's sure been a yeah. struggle. Yeah, Man. long, long Man, time. Long yeah. time. <laughs> when we worked together in Afghanistan in 2002, his son was about the same age, about six months old as my daughter was when I was there. So uh, it, it, it's kind of neat to see him now as a 20-year-old grown man. After 20 years, we meet him here. I'm very happy. I'm very happy with this. Yeah, this is a long time. He is my best friend. As he and his family adjust to life in the United States, Hisari is concerned for those left behind living under Taliban rule. Most of the people, they lost their work, their job, and everything. The people, the people is poor right now. They have no salary, no food, and nothing. While Hisari's flight from Afghanistan to the United States has been difficult and uncertain, today he is settling into a new apartment and a new job. Thank you, it all comes from the heart. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thankful for the opportunities made possible by the assistance of those he once served and protected, like Greer and Cole. He's a great guy, and, and, and I would do you know anything I could to, to help him. I think he's more honorable than about anybody I've ever met or worked with. The U.S. State Department believes as many as 60,000 Afghans and their family members who worked alongside U.S. forces were still waiting for immigrant visas to the United States in the months after the Taliban took control of the country. The total number of interpreters, like the ones we've profiled in this program, who have successfully reached the United States is unknown at this time. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of the Inside Story. I'm Kane Fairbaugh. You can connect with us on Facebook and Instagram at VOA News. And you can visit our website anytime at voanews.com. See you next week for the Inside Story.